Epilogue The Spanish Conquest To the victor go not only these spoils as the old world as the old saw would have it, but also the opportunity to tell the story of a victory without fear of contradiction. The Spaniards and generations of historians, including even the renowned William Prescott, have presented the conquest of Mexico by a handful of brave and resourceful soldiers as the inevitable consequence of the cultural superiority of European over native cultures. As the Aztec scholar Inga Clendenin has forcefully put it, historians are the camp followers of the imperialists. Thanks to a closer and more critical re reading of the sources, we can now see that there was considerable rewriting and often blatant distortion of the course of events, even with such otherwise impeccable figures as Father Sahagun. Particularly untrustworthy are the self-serving letters of Hernán Cortés to his sovereign Charles V, since that wily commander was acting illegally and without royal permission throughout his campaigns on Mexican soil. In the history partially fabricated by, by the Spanish, the Aztecs' terrible destiny had been preordained in, in the weak and vacillating figure of, Mot of Motecuzoma Xocoyotzin, held spellbound by a series of sinister omens and by the myth of the returning god ruler, that Dobitzin Getzcoat had come back in the person of Cortes himself. According to these accounts, now held in suspicion by specialists in Aztec culture, Strange portents had appeared to the terrified monarch in the final ten years of his reign. The first of these was a great comet, like a tongue of fire, like a flame, as if showering the light of dawn. Then in succession, a tower of the great temple burned mysteriously. The water of the lake foamed and boiled and flooded the capital, and a woman was heard crying in, in the night to the streets of Tenochtitlan. Two-headed men were discovered and brought to the ruler, but they vanished as soon as he looked at them. Worst of all, fisherfolk snared a bird like a crane, which had a mirror on its forehead. They showed it to Montecusoma in broad daylight, and when he gazed into the mirror, he saw the, he saw the shining stars. Looking a second time, he saw armed men borne on, on the backs of deer. Consulting his soothsayers, they could tell him nothing, but Nasahuapili, king of Texcoco, forecast the destruction of Mexico. Inflicting great cruelties on his magicians for their inability to forestall the doom that he saw impending, the Aztec monarch was said to be dumbfounded when an uncouth man arrived one day from the Gulf Coast and demanded to be taken into his presence. I come, he announced, to advise you that a great mountain has been seen on the waters, moving from one part to the other, without touching the rocks. Quickly clapping the wretch in jail, he dispatched two trusted messengers to the coast to determine if this was so. When they, when they return, they confirm the story previously told, adding that strange men with white faces and hands and long beards had set off in a boat from, quote-unquote, a house on the water. Secretly convinced that these were Getzkowalt and his companions, he had the sacred livery of the god and the food of the, of the land offered to them, which they immediately took back with them to their watery home, thus confirming his surmises. The gods had left some of their own foods in the form of sweet-tasting biscuits on the beach, the monarch ordered the holy wafers to be placed in a gilded gourd, covered with rich cloths, and carried by a procession of chanting priests to the Tula of the Toltecs, where they were rev reverently interred in the ruins of Getzcoat's temple. The mountain that moved was in reality a, the Spanish ship commanded by Juan de Grijalva, which after skirting the coast of Yucatan made the first Spanish landing on Mexican soil in the year 1518 near modern Veracruz. This reconnaissance was followed up in 1519 by the Great Armada that embarked from Cuba under the leadership of Hernán Cortés. The peoples of the Gulf Coast, some of whom were vassals of the Aztec Huaytlatuani, put up little resistance to these strange beings, and Cortés soon learned of their disaffection with the Aztec state and with the heavy tribute that they had been forced to pay. On their way to the valley of Mexico in the heart of the empire, the conquistadors met with opposition from the Tlaxcalans. After crushing these fierce enemies of the Triple Alliance, Cortes gained them as willing allies, the Tlaxcalans would come to play a key role in the overthrow of Mexican civilization. A figure crucial to Cortes's plans was his native interpreter and mistress, known to history as La Malinche. This beautiful and intelligent woman was of noble birth, and had been presented to Cortes by a merchant prince of coastal Tabasco. Much of his success in dealing with the Aztecs must be attributed to the astuteness and understanding of this remarkable personage. But misunderstandings nevertheless seem to have been the rule in confrontation and clash of these two cultures. For instance, far from being held in thrall by a view of Cortes as the returned Quetzalcoatl, Motecusoma appears to have dealt with him as what he said he was, namely, an ambassador from a distant and unknown ruler. As such, Cortes had to be treated with respect and hospitality. Welcome into the great capital, and even into the royal palace, Cortes 
chose to take his host captive to the chagrin and disgust of the Huaytlatuani subjects. The denouement of this tragic story is well known. Learning that a rival military expedition under Banfilo Narbaez had been sent to Veracruz by his enemy, the, the governor of Cuba, with orders for his arrest, Cortes moved down the coast and defeated the interlopers. On his return to Denochtitlan, he found the captain in full revolt. During the uprising, Moltecuzuma was killed, the Spaniards being the likely perpetrators, and the booty-laden conquistadores were forced to, f to flee the city by night, with great loss of life. Thus ended the first phase of the conquest. Withdrawing to the friendly sanctuary of Tlaxcalan, the invaders recovered their strength while Cortes made new plans. Eventually, both armies met in a pitched battle on the plains near Otumba, a confrontation in which Spanish arms triumphed. Then, joined by his ferocious allies from Tlaxcalan, from Tascalan, Cortes once again marched against Tenochtitlan, building an invasion fleet along the shores of the Great Lake. The siege of Tenochtitlan began in May 1521 and ended after a heroic defense led by Cuauhtémoc, the last and bravest of the Aztec conquerors, on August 13th of that year. There then ensued a bloodbath at the hands of the revengeful Tlaxcalans that sickened even the most battle-hardened conquistadores. Although Cortes received Cuauhtémoc with honor, he had him hanged, drawn and quartered three years later. The fifth son had indeed perished. How is it that a tiny force of about 400 men have been able to overthrow a powerful empire of at least 11 million people? First of all, there is little question that the weaponry of these men of the Renaissance was superior to the essentially Stone Age armament of the Aztecs. Thundering cannons, steel swords wielded by mounted horsemen, steel armor, crossbows, and mastiff-like war dogs previously trained in the Antilles to save the flesh of the Indians, all contributed to the Aztec downfall. A second factor was that of Spanish tactics. The Spaniards fought by rules other than those that had prevailed for millennia in Mesoamerica. To the Aztecs, as Inga Clendenin has noted, battle was, base was ideally a sacred duel between matched warriors. In fact, before the Aztecs waged war on a town or province, they would, they would often send them arms to make sure that the contenders were so matched. The level playing field meant nothing to the Spaniards, whom the Aztecs perceived as cowards. They shot their weapons at a distance, avoided hand-to-hand -hand combat with native warriors, and took refuge behind their cannons. The Spaniards' horses were held in far higher estimation. Equally incomprehensible and thus devastating to the Aztecs' defense was the Spanish policy of wholesale terror. So well exemplified by the act of Cortes in cutting off the hands of over 50 Tlaxcalan emissaries admitted in peace into the Spanish camp, or the massacre of vast numbers of unarmed warriors at the order of the terrible Pedro de Alvarado, while they were dancing in a feast. Thirdly, the role played by thousands upon thousands of seasoned Tlaxcalan warriors, the deadliest enemies of the Triple Alliance, can hardly be overlooked. Not only were they vital to the defeat of the Aztec Empire, but they continued to serve as an auxiliary army in the conquest of the rest of Mesoamerica, even participating in the takeover of the highland Maya states. But most significant of all was that invisible and deadly ally brought by the invaders from the Old World, infectious disease to which the New World natives had absolutely no resistance. Smallpox was, was apparently introduced by a black who arrived with the Narbaez expedition of 1520 and ravaged Mexico. It had decimated central Mexico even before Cortes began his siege, along with measles, whooping cough, and malaria, and perhaps yellow fever as well. It led to a terrible mortality that must have enormously reduced the size and effectiveness of the Aztec field forces, and led to a general feeling of despair and hopelessness among the population. Given these four factors, it is a wonder that Aztec resistance lasted as long as it did. The completeness of the Aztec defeat is beautifully divine in an Aztec limit. Broken spears lie on the roads. We have torn our hair in grief. The houses are roofless now, and their walls are red with blood. Worms are swarming in the streets and plazas, and the walls are splattered with gore. The water has turned red as if it were dyed, and when we drink it, it has the taste of brine. We have pounded our hands in despair against the adobe walls, for our inheritance, our city, is lost and dead. The shields of our warriors were its defense, but they could not save it. New Spain and the Colonial World Within a space of about three years following the, the fall of Tenochtitlan, most of Mexico between the Isthmus of Tehuantepec and the Chichimec frontier had fallen to the Spaniards and their grim Tlaxcalan allies. During this period, there were a number of native revolts, such as occurred during among the, Tar the Tarascans, but these were quickly suppressed. This vast territory became organized as New Spain, with a viceroy responsible to the Spanish king 
to the Council of the Indies. The conquistadors had not been ordinary soldiers, but adventurers expecting riches. To placate them, the crown granted them encomiendas, in which each encomendero would receive tribute payments from vast numbers of, of Indians. In return, the encomendero would ensure that their souls would be saved through conversion to Christianity. In time, this led to incredible abuse against the natives, and in 1549, a new system, repartimiento, was substituted, in which the natives were theoretically stripped Supposed to, were supposed to get fair wages for their labor. However, through the cupidity of the Spanish overlords and bureaucratic abuse, repartimiento swiftly turned into a system of forced labor. Almost immediately following the conquest, Mexico's social, economic, and religious life were transformed. Even the landscape suffered immense changes. The fate of the elite class that had ruled the old pre-Spanish cities was, was too poor. Many of them disappeared altogether, and with them the elite culture that they had created while others, perhaps more pliant, were given titles by the new regime and used as tribute and labor gatherers. It was these latter who were significant agents of acculturation as they were converted to the new religion and learned the Castilian language. The great native cities and towns of Mexico were leveled, along with thousands of pagan temples, to be replaced by urban settlements laid out on the grid pattern favored by the authorities in urban America. The old Capotin became barrios and the Capoli temples parish churches. The economic transformation of Mexico began with the introduction of chickens, pigs, and the herd animals so important to life in the old country, cattle, horses, sheep, and goats, the two latter contributing to the destruction of the landscape through overgrazing, iron tools in the plow, European fruit trees, and crops like wheat and chickpeas. The Spaniards initially spurned native foods such as maize and beans. The, the, repart, the repartimiento system led to the growth of vast haciendas, at first dependent upon forced labor. After abolition in later centuries, this was transformed into debt bondage, a state of affairs that was to last until the Mexican Revolution. New Spain proved to be Spanish, the Spanish Empire's richest source of silver, and hundreds of thousands of natives were put to work in these silver mines under the most terrible conditions. In line with the doctrine promulgated by the papacy, that the New World natives had souls and thus must not be enslaved but converted to the true faith, the conquistadores were truly serious about conversion. This task was placed in the hands of the Mendican orders, and twelve Franciscan friars duly arrived in the newly founded Mexico City, built on the ruins of Tenochtitlan. As they walked unshod and in patch robes through the city streets, the native population was truly awestruck by their poverty and sin sincerity. The, the Franciscans viewed the Indians with paternalistic ki kindliness and saw them as raw material on which to fashion a new utopian world free from the sins that were so apparent in the Spanish settlers. They quickly learned Nahuatl and began early to instruct the sons of the native nobility in Christian values and learning. Naturally, they came into frequent conflict with the Ecomenderos. Other orders soon followed, Augustinians, Dominicans, and eventually the Jesuits. Conversion, though, was often only skin deep, and later on in the 16th century, the secular and religious clergy came to recognize this. The basic similarity between many aspects of the Aztec religion and the Spanish Catholicism has led to a syncretism between the two per that persists today in the more indigenous parts of Mexico. There, tr there truly were, and often are, idols behind altars. The church's attempts to stamp out paganism, however, were hampered by the exemption that Indians had from the investigations of the Inquisition, and many old beliefs and practices flourished, particularly in the field of Mexican. Away from the mines and the great haciendas, many Indian communities preserved their self-sufficiency and had their own lands. These were known as Repúblicas de Indios and were organized on the Spanish cabildo system of town administration. On top was an elected governor, in early years often a native noble. Below him were the alcades, judges for minor crimes or civil suits, and regidores, counselors who legislated laws for, lo for local matters. At first, all electors were from the nobility, but as this dwindled, the commoners or Masa Waltin took over. And under the friars' tutelage, the native communities had adopted the, re the religious co-fraternities so important to Spanish life, and these became inter intertwined with the cabildo system. One advance in this civil religious hierarchy through a series of cargos, or burdensome offices, that became more and more costly as one achieved ever higher rank and honor. One can see such an hi a hierarchy in many indigenous communities today. The Ladinoization of Mexico As historian Woodrow Bora has demonstrated, after 1600, New Spain entered a profound century of depression, when supplies of both food and labor suffered an enormous drop. 
This was a direct result of a crash in the Indian population is shown by the following figures. In 1519, on the eve of the, of the conquest, there were an estimated 11 million souls in central Mexico. By the close of the 16th century, there were only about 2.5 million Indians left, and by 1650, no more than 1.5 million, just 13.6% of the pre-conquest total. While the Spanish clergy was prone to ascribe this demographic disaster to the allegedly drunken habits of their charges, it is clear that the major cause was a series of great epidemics, beginning in 1520, but eventually dra especially drastic in 1545 through 1546, and 1576 through 1579. Intolerable working conditions in the silver mines and on the great estates certainly added to the toll. At the same time that the Indian demographic collapse was taking place, the white and mestizo mixed population was steadily increasing. When the great sugar king Hacienas were established in the Gulf Coast lowlands, landowners like Cortez had imported African slaves and these certainly contributed to the racial mixture in those areas. But it was the people of mixed Indian white race, or Ladinos as they are known, who came to represent the majority of the Mexican people, at least towards the end of the colonial era. Peninsular Spanish notions of purity of race and superiority of the Catholic religion were transformed during these centuries to a system of values in which Hispanicized people of light skin, wearing European clothing and, and living in or near the center of a, of a community, having Spanish surnames and able to re read and write, were considered inherently far better than the darker skinned, supersti superstitious, frequently Ill illiterate Indians. Accordingly, the, Ladin the Ladinos came to occupy the middle rank of the political and economic hierarchy while the Indians occupied the lowest. This is the situation that yet prevails in many parts of Mexico. If there had been no demographic catastrophe among the natives, the political and cultural status of the native population would have been very different indeed. The Aftermath The independence from Spain that Mexico had achieved by 1821 did little to ameliorate the unhappy lot of its indigenous people. In fact, the crown and the church have been the principal protectors of native rights throughout colonial history against the abuses of the settlers. For much of the 19th century, Mexico was in the throes of continuous wars, a situation only brought to an end with the dictatorial regime of Porfirio Diaz, himself a largely Zap Zapotec Ladino from Oaxaca. The Mexican Revolution, which began in 1910, brought sweeping changes to the Mexican countryside, and thus to the native peoples who were mainly poor rural peasants. The old haciendas were broken up and the land distributed to farming communities in the form of ejidos, communal land holding groups supposedly based on Aztec insti institutions. Debt slavery was abolished. Especially under the radical presidency 1934-1940 of Lazaro Cárdenas, the rights of Indians to economic well-being were at last recognized by the Mexican government. With the establishment of a national indigenous institute, rural schools and economic assistance centers were set up in native communities. But the goal of these government programs remains incorporation of these communities into national life, in other words, Lad Ladinoization in modern dress. Every effort is made to wean people away from their language and from their traditional culture, a process that has been accelerated in some areas where massive hydroelectric projects have uprooted many thousands of native peoples from their traditional lands. Like fourth world populations elsewhere in the third world, where rapid economic development is the national goal, the right of Mexico's original inhabitants to, to their own cultures and their own languages is under constant pressure. Whether they will be able to re maintain their cultural integrity as change becomes inevitable remains to be seen. This concludes the epilogue.